Thank you. I am Sam Carrico, and this is the Film Fan Club Show, a show with a viewership that would make Black Adam look like a huge success. Well, Oscar season is upon us, and I understand the urge to roll your eyes. Award shows usually feel like a slap in the face, if you know what I mean. Oftentimes, it seems like the nominees are films that barely any of us have heard of. Films made for older coastal elites that want to feel good about their values, but don't want their worldview challenged in any real way. If not, it's usually a big Hollywood production about how great Hollywood is or was. The Academy has a clear bias against genres like horror and mediums like animation as well, to the extent that there's basically no point in watching the Oscars if you're a fan of either, because you know your favorite thing has no shot at Best Picture. Don't even get me started on a net. Ratings in recent years seem to validate the disinterest, too, with last year's Academy Awards being the second least watched since the mid-1970s, when Nielsen began tracking ratings. Second least watched? That's even with the slap! Award season does give us a unique opportunity, though, to reflect on the previous year in film. And luckily for you, I'm here to give you the view of The Working Man, the real best pictures of 2022. And check the upload date. Don't accuse me of copying the Oscars, because I made this video first. Starting with number five, while I enjoyed Get Out, I have to say that Us was a huge step down, so I was very relieved that Nope was as good as it was. I don't want to spoil the ending in case you haven't seen it yet, because part of the charm was that I never knew what was going to happen next in this movie. The payoffs were super satisfying and all the characters' actions made perfect sense, something that's actually a lot to ask for in a horror movie. Nope has a theme of humanity trying to tame nature that is conveyed in a way that doesn't feel forced. You could say it feels natural. It doesn't forego logic to get this message across either. Kiki Palmer is a standout performance, so much so that I can't wait to see what she turns up in next. And finally, the film is scary. It builds tension without relying on jump scares. There's one scene in particular that is so memorable that it'll stay with me for a while. Nope is my fifth favorite film from 2022. My number four pick might be lesser known, which is a shame. I remember being the only one in the theater at the time and thinking that more people need to see this. That movie's called Duel. Here's what I said on the show after I saw Duel back in April. Karen Gillan gives a career best performance as this terminally ill woman who chooses to be replaced by a clone after her death. And whenever her, let's say her illness goes into remission, they have to settle it by fighting to the death to decide who will live on. It's definitely not for everybody, but I love this movie. I've never seen something so funny, yet so creepy at the same time. Gillen is able to brilliantly portray the subtle differences between these two identical characters in a way that you're never confused. It's a travesty, an absolute crime, that this movie only made $118,000 at the box office. If you'd like to check it out, Duel is currently available to stream on AMC Plus and Hulu. So those are pretty dark movies at numbers 4 and 5. You may be noticing a pattern here, so let's break it up. My number three film of 2022 was Marcel the Shell with Shoes On. I never would have thought that a kid's movie about an animated shell would make it on this list, but here we are. Marcel is one of the most well-developed characters I've seen in film this past year, in huge part due to Jenny Slate's performance. She's very funny in the role, too. The dynamic between Marcel and Dean is so endearing, and the documentary-style format worked really well here. It's very low stakes, that almost works to the movie's advantage. It was so refreshing not to have to worry about the world ending for two seconds, and it's a great testament that anything can be engaging, even a movie about a shell with shoes on. This movie was such an enjoyable, light-hearted story about family that it woke up even my cold dead heart. It's my third favorite film of the year. My number two pick is actually a movie that I don't think I gave a fair shot when I first reviewed it. Several things about Matt Reeves' The Batman either grew on me or were recontextualized to the point that the movie became not only one of my favorites from 2022, but one of my favorite Batman stories in general. I still think the movie goes on like 30 minutes too long, but I understand now the repeated use of the phrase, I'm vengeance at the end, and what the film is trying to say about how Batman can impact the everyday citizens of Gotham. Bruce's realization that he has to be a better role model and his subsequent decision to save people works really well for me upon rewatch. I knew Robert Pattinson was a good actor after The Lighthouse, but he surpassed even my raised expectations in his portrayal of Bruce Wayne. The entire cast is stellar too, and the world of Gotham is fleshed out really well. You can tell Matt Reeves gives a shit, a nice change of pace from last year's Marvel movies. DC as a whole may be in turmoil, but I can't wait to see more from this version of Gotham. The Batman is my number two film of 2022. Which brings us to number one. What was last year's best film? Well, I hate to disappoint and pick the obvious answer. Sometimes the obvious answer is the correct one. The best picture of 2022 has got to be everything, everywhere, all at once. This movie has all the heart of some of the best Oscar winners, but also the imagination of some of the best high-concept blockbusters. Michelle Yeoh and Ki Hui Kwan are incredible in the lead roles, but the real standout performance to me was Stephanie Hsu as their on-screen daughter. 
released just a couple weeks before Doctor Strange 2, this is what a multiverse traveling epic should be. I came for the concept, but stayed for the family drama. This movie, yes, has great action and fight choreography, but it also made me laugh and made me cry, somehow blending these tones seamlessly. Now I know I spent a good chunk of this monologue bashing award shows, but this year, the Oscars have a chance to make things right. Seeing everything everywhere all at once get so many nominations has been a pleasant surprise, but it's up to the Academy to bring it home. Will they read the writing on the wall and give the award to everything everywhere? Or will they give it to something like The Fablemans because it's Spielberg's turn? Well, we know the truth. Regardless of what happens Sunday, the best movie of 2022 was everything everywhere all at once. So joining me now to react to my list and give their own best pictures of 2022, we've got two returning champions, friends of the show. First up, he is the co-host of the Double Feature Movie Club and Caden Friends. You can find both of those on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Cade Thomas is back. Hey, Cade. Hello. Thanks for having me. And also joining us again, he is the pop culture writer for the Tulsa world. Jimmy Tremble is back. Hey, Jimmy. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm flattered you would ask me back. Hey, it's good to see both of you here again, you know. Coming out of my monologue, Kate, I wanted to ask you this. Uh, mm -hmm. I talk about everything everywhere all at once. I really strongly believe that's the best picture of 2022. Mm -hmm. I was hoping you would get nominated for best picture. It did get nominated. And I made the case that, you know, this is a movie that has such broad appeal that the Academy could kind of, kind of finally get it right and pick a movie that is widely agreed upon as the best picture of 2022. But yes. then they had to go and nominate Top Gun Maverick. They went and nominated Top Gun Maverick. So is my point basically, is it a mute point now? Is Top Gun Maverick the people's choice for best picture? And, and am I gonna look out of touch if everything everywhere wins? Cade, what do you think? Um, I don't, I, I, I don't think so. I, 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 uh, yeah, I, I agree that everywhere, everything, everywhere, all at once it should get it. It is, um, the most movie, um, certainly. And, um, I, every, everyone I've know that have seen, has seen that movie has loved it. It is almost universally loved for the people who have watched it. Um, but that being said, of course, Top Gun Maverick has been seen by more people and, um, biggest movie and all that stuff. So, I mean, like, I, you're never going to win over that crowd from the Academy Awards. I think that, you know, Top Gun is certainly should win people's choice or whatever, <laughs> one of those awards, which nothing against that, but it's, that's the crowd it's going after and it does that successfully. And I, I don't know. I, I guess I'm fine that it's nominated, but no, it shouldn't, it shouldn't win best picture. That's one of my things. I, I'm fine with it being nominated. It's mm -hmm. not anywhere in my top 10 15 best no, of the year, no. but it's a good movie. I just, I really, I just, everything everywhere is an original film. You know, uh, it, it's not based on an existing IP. It's not a sequel to anything. Top Gun is so good. It's, it, it has a lot of practical stunts, you know, cause it's a Tom Cruise film. There's a lot of passion behind it. It's a sequel to an old IP though. And I just, I'm worried about Hollywood getting the wrong signals from a, a top gun uh winning i mean yeah it already won the box office that's a huge award right there so we don't need to give it best picture anyways i i just that my whole monologue was on the the premise of everything everywhere being the people's choice so uh i'm gonna stand by it i'm just gonna own it now so uh well jimmy i'm, I'm curious to hear what you think don't you guys both think though that maybe the best picture thing has gotten so far away from commercial success because like the last mm -hmm. few winners I don't know how many people actually saw those films. It's almost like if you're a box office success or you're a major film, there's a bias against you. And um, in some of the winners lately, best picture have just been head scratchers at the Oscars. I could definitely yeah. see where you're getting that a little bit, but I think the tide's starting to turn. You know, we see, I think Black Panther was nominated in 20, for, for whenever it came out in 2018. Mm -hmm. uh, Joker uh, was nominated when it came out. And then now Top Gun. So I guess... You know, there's a little bit, I definitely would see what you, I, I wonder if the Academy is like, okay, you got nominated. You're never going to actually win, but you're nominated. Right. There's that. So I'm curious. Mm -hmm. Which is probably is why they spread out. Like they've made it so many nominees was because of the dark Knight situation where yeah. uh, like, and so now there's going to be, but if there was the original five, I would still think that, yeah, they probably top gun probably would not have gotten nominated. It's That's like, we're going to nominate you, but we're not going to let you win. <laughs> yeah. It's like the Caddyshack line where Bill Murray and uh, uh, oh, who Chevy Chase are having the exchange. Like, 
I've got a pool for me and a pond for you. You know, a pond's good for you. So you guys just have the pond and have your nomination and be happy with that. Jimmy, I'm curious to hear what your, uh, uh, let's start. I started with my five, my number five and worked my way up to my best film of 2022. So I'm curious where your list starts with number five. Well, this is the part where like the student comes to the teacher and tries to have a really good excuse for not having their homework turned in. I did not see, I've got a very short list of movies I saw in uh, 2022 because I'm busy with a side project that's just eating up all my spare time. I spent more time in the theater than any time since not counting COVID ever. Uh, I'll, I'll just fire off some movies that I did uh, see and like. Uh, I mean, the, the Batman I did like, but I thought it was too long and a little too dark. I, you want a movie to leave you wanting more. And when I start looking at my watch to say, uh, how much longer? That's a yeah. bad sign. And I did that during that movie. Although I do like the take on it. That, and I thought the Catwoman was was great. Uh, Prey, which is not, uh, you know, it was a like a Netflix film, right? Right. It was on Hulu, I think. Hulu. I, I did enjoy that take on the Predator franchise. It's yeah. not the best picture of the year, but I did like the fresh spin of taking it all the way back. Um the, a movie I really enjoyed, and it, I saw two Best Picture nominees. I saw uh, Black Panther, right? And I saw The Fablemans. I, I I was not all that impressed with any of the comic book movies this year, whether it's uh, Doctor Strange or Black Panther or Thor. Uh, to me, that they, they don't seem to have like the exact same magic as the movies from Marvel uh, in the past. But Fablemans, I really dug. Uh, you, you almost can't believe that Spielberg was telling these stories about his family members. I and mean, if we were the filmmaker, I don't know if I could ditch, dish that dirt on my family, but he did for all of our enjoyment. And, and I left the theater kind of digging it. I also really liked Fableman's. I like, I think it works, <clears throat> excuse me, because it's not like a direct biopic. It's kind of like heavily influenced on his childhood. Mm -hmm. So he can kind of, have a little bit of plausible de deniability, but also go there. Because you often hear about like, uh, whenever the person whose life, who they're basing the life on this person, when they're involved, it's gonna be a very clean view of the uh, the person. Like they're doing a, a, bi a, a biopic about Michael Jackson and they just cast, I think his nephew in the role. So, and the, and the family, the estate is making the film. So you're like, okay, you're not really gonna get the true, but I, what, I, what I was really impressed by was Steven, Steven Spielberg's ability to actually go there in the Fablemans. And I think Steve, Spielberg, like I've seen Ready Player One and I've seen a couple of his more recent films. And sometimes sometimes I wonder, is he bringing it these days? And the Fablemans was a great reminder that now this is one of the best filmmakers of all time. I don't think it's my favorite of the year, but it was a great, uh, it was another, it, it was refreshing to have like another classic Spielberg movie. Yeah, the, the other best picture nominee I saw was Women Talking, which is a really unique film because it's all strictly uh, dialogue that takes place in this hayloft yeah. of a barn. I mean, it's uh, certainly not remotely the same content, subject matter, or anything, but it reminded me in only a location way of The Breakfast Club in that everything's taking place in this one room and it's all conversation between these people. Certainly women talking is much more serious than yeah. The Breakfast Club. Uh, is it based on anything? I, I mean, I'm yes. only... Is it, is it like a stage play or something or is it a... It, it was a book. Oh, it was a uh, book. Okay. Based on a real life situation, a uh, uh, religious mission village, uh, I think in South America, and so yes, it was based on real events. I did feel for the, you know, there's really one male character in the whole movie, and I I did feel for him and the girl that he had an interest in, and the, uh oh, you know, something's there's going to be a cost here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's a great uh, acting um, uh, showcase for a lot of these these. Uh, Seems these, like it uh, could have been a stage play if it's one in one location. Probably kind of would a, have been better yeah. as a stage play. And, and when, when you mentioned Breakfast Club, I'm like, why is it Breakfast Club been a stage play? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know. Seems like that'd be a really great little close knit music. Yeah. Just someone take that. <laughs> Kate, let's hear some of your favorite favorites from 2022. I know there's a little mm -hmm. bit of crossover on our lists. Yes, there is. Um, also five on my list is Nope. I loved Nope. Um, I think it's, I think it's Jordan Peele's best in my opinion. I, 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 I really, really, really enjoyed that movie. Enjoyed the performances I, and enjoyed the way he told that story and broke it up was, was really 
was really impressive. I agree. It's probably his best film. I like I liked Get Out a lot. I, I mm -hmm. but I think I think I mentioned in my monologue that Us was a little bit of a step down. So I was like, mm -hmm. who is he going to be able to stick this landing? And I was so I was so surprised. The the Gordy what Gordy Gordo Gordy the, yeah. the monkey in that movie. That's yes. all I'll say. That's all I'll say. That's the best part of it. In fact, like that storyline and um, Stephen Yoon's storyline, all that was like the best part of the movie. Um, and uh, yeah. And the way it ties into the theme of mm -hmm. of of, uh, of man taming nature, oh, so good. Mm -hmm. um, and, and and scary and real and visceral and but also like through this like nostalgic lens of of the movie, it's it was a lot of feelings. It was it was really good. Um, and then my four, you saw me move on. Um, sure, yeah, we can keep going. My four, I absolutely loved the menu. I thought that yes. that was so um, such a good little thriller and uh, character ensemble, and they all had things to do, and it was incredibly funny. I didn't really know, realize going in from the trailer that this was going to be like such a dark, richly dark comedy, um, and I just had a really uh, great time <laughs> watching this 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 horrific thing sort of take place, and I, I love the tone of it. Mm -hmm. um, it was just a fun ride. Um, I love that movie. That is such a hard tone to nail down because, mm -hmm. like, it is equally a comedy and a horror film, and and mm -hmm. and Ray Fiennes. It's a lot of it is part in, in due uh, large part due to uh, Ray Fiennes' performance. Like the uh, what is the uh, I, I can't remember the line exactly, but he's like, "Oh, did you go to this expensive college?" And, <laughs> yeah. and, and like, "Yeah." He's like, "Do you have student loans?" <laughs> no, I'm sorry, you must die. <laughs> it's such yeah. a it's such a witty uh, uh, movie, and and mm -hmm. Anya Taylor Joy, man, she just can continues to bring it my goodness oh nicholas Holt as well his his mm. role in that film and what it says about the nature here we are being armchair critics about <laughs> movies but what it has to say about the nature of a okay you can analyze this thing but can mm. you do it uh it's a, a well a very smart movie as well mm -hmm. and uh john lugerzama or how you pronounce his name yeah, yeah. Uh, was great in it as just like that sort of uh you know, uh, <laughs> this this actor who's washed mm -hmm. up and trying to find his next thing, and the, the fact why he's there is oh, that's just one of the funniest reveals ever. Um, and the uh, end, I mean, without giving anything uh, away, you just like you're like, how crazy is this gonna go? And it just keeps surprising you every time. Ooh. So good movie. Yeah, it goes different. What like when you sort of like in your head you're like okay where's this going to go and you, you you're kind of guessing as to where it's going to go and where the dark place is and it goes in different directions than i think initially i thought it was going to yeah. too liked it i think it's on streaming now so if you want to some on, on some streaming thing um but, it seems uh, like it would be right up your alley so i'm not shocked that uh that it's on your list what do you have that was your number uh four or number four. three it's three. number four okay what's your number three Number three for me was, and this is just a personal thing because I um, I love this franchise. Um, it's quite possibly my favorite franchise that exists. And um, Scream, it's the new Scream movie. Oh, um, yes. Uh, and I'm so excited for the next Scream, uh, uh, Scream 6 coming out. Um, but I, I, I thought that that was... I was scared because, of course, this is the first time without Wes Craven mm -hmm. and the only other time that they haven't done it with Kevin Williamson, the screenwriter. So right. and the last time that happened, it was not a good turnout. Um, so uh, I was nervous to be handing it to these, uh, these other uh, this new uh, group of people. Uh, they had did, of course, Ready or Not, which a lot of people loved. I was not the hugest fan of Ready or Not. I liked the idea of it, but the execution was kind of odd. You're correct for having Scream 5 above <laughs> Knives Out on your list. <laughs> but it's ironic because you're talking about the themes, and Scream uh -huh. 5, I think part of the theme of that movie is criticizing yeah. me for my reaction to the Ryan Johnson <laughs> Last Jedi. Isn't it, though? Isn't it like kind of it's about It's part that? of it because in Scream 5, the, the last Scream movie was directed by Ryan Johnson. That's and the last it, yeah. Stab, the last Stab movie was created, was, was created yeah. by Ryan Johnson. And all the fans hated it. And I need it's to about that. it's about these fans making this them saying, "Well, we need to go back to our roots of what this franchise is about." Do it right. So we're going to go back to Woodsboro and because essentially the stab movies, which are the movies within movies, haven't been good since they've deviated from real life. So they were trying to restart uh, a new series of things, which is why I think we're heading to in a, in a way in these new films of going along of 
there's going it's going to be sort of these people who are fans and almost a cult of which is oh, yeah, those... in the trailer you see the, the mm. all the ghosts uh the ghost yes. face costumes yeah yeah one of the through lines from the 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 what they were post going to do with scream three was going to be like this cult aspect and it was going to be around Stu mocker the second killer from the first movie and yeah. he was going to be alive and that was but that was all ditched that was matthew for... lillard yes matthew right? lillard's character because he has not been talked about and it's still left somewhat open i mean he could come back he could come back yeah because he wasn't shot in the head like they always do, do you think this. they'll follow that up in oh, this yeah. movie with it oh really i that's my theory i think oh, that that's okay. what they're they're building to which i think a lot of fans think and a lot of fans are made or <laughs> are like no that can't be it because that's so kind of ridiculous that's where i think it's going i think that they're going to keep leading it the last one there was too many references to sort of Stu mocker and the fact that there's this this online cult that existed that I think that's going to be the through line for these new movies okay. that it's probably it's going to be revealed that it's a larger thing. And then at the head of it's going to be this guy who was locked up in an insane asylum or something, you know, for this whole time. And that's Matthew Lillard's character. That's my idea. I think that that's I, I <laughs> need to rewatch the fifth, the five scream movies. Jimmy, have we already, have we gone through all of your list? I, I know we're focusing on Kate a lot. You know what? This is not going to win any awards, but a movie yeah. I really enjoyed was the Al Yankovic movie weird? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I've heard a lot of good things. I was right off it, my list at number. I had it in like eleven or whatever. I really did. It, like it was that, great though. fun, and I went into it thinking it was going to be a straight uh, biographical film. And it's. I'd be curious to know where, at uh, what point people watch where you go. Wait a minute, that's not <laughs> at all. Yeah. Uh, but it, it really goes off into some fun places, and it's kind of a. Uh, it's certainly not UHF because UHF is its own thing. But to me, this is way more fun than UHF. I have to see, I keep hearing such good things. I think uh, Bill Maher <laughs> had uh, Al uh, Yankovic on his podcast and I heard them talking about it. And the more they talked about it, I was like, okay, this isn't your average biopic. So now hearing that recommendation, I'm like, dang it. Okay. It's, it's on a, it's on some sort of streaming, right? It's on Roku. Yes. That's it. And that's, is that free? It's free. You can just watch it you know, on your Roku channel. I think it's just even on the website too. Oh, I love uh, that. See, that's yeah. nice. And uh, it, it's got a lot. I mean, the, the cameos in it, I typically, you know, I'm not a big fan of celebrity cameos, but they nail because it's making fun of celebrity cameos because oftentimes these celebrities are playing celebrities of the time. Um, and they're like odd little, like, I mean, uh, I'm not going to spoil a lot of them, but uh, like Conan O'Brien appears as Andy Warhol in it. Oh, and <laughs> <laughs> and so that's the kind of level of, of of celebrity that you get playing these these other celebrities. It's pretty it's pretty funny. That's Jack good. Black is Wolfman Jack, right? <laughs> yes, yes. There's all these there's a there's a the quote unquote celebrity party that happens in the yeah. middle of it, and it's all of these like um these because I mean, like it, it's it's pulling from a lot of you know Weird Al did comedy Bang Bang for a while, so it's mm -hmm. that level of of comedians too. So like Paul F. Tompkins is in it, and a lot of uh, you know, um, Scott Ackerman. There's there's a lot of just different people that are from that L.A. comedy um, improv comedy scene that appear in this too, as as a lot of things. So it's it's a it's a really really fun fun movie. Kate, where did we leave off on your list? So yeah, you got two left, right? I have two left. Uh, number two, people either love or hate it that they've seen it. I've um, it's a divisive film, Barbarian. I love. Oh, I love. Yeah, that movie is really good. Yeah. I loved Barbarian. I loved where it went and everything. Some people, some people didn't like it, um, but I thought it was a perfect balance of of the elevated horror that everyone's become used to and and all that, and sort of, but saying we can still have fun and still be schlocky and still be campy, and it's a yeah. perfect marriage of those two ideas. Um, and so I, I and I, I thought that's fun because horror hasn't been fun for <laughs> some time. Um, so it's that's it's a good point. Yeah, it's nice to have a fun horror movie. Mm -hmm. And that movie, I, it's a great point that about the balance. And and, and I, I, there's a moment. It's a big spoiler at the end, but you yeah, know, but there's a, a moment where you just feel really connected to these to the bad guy in the film, um, <laughs> yeah. and and you almost feel bad for it. Uh -huh. At the very end, I don't know if you know what, what exact part I'm talking about, but it's just like, dang, okay, you know, mm -hmm. it's very. And then the film uh, kind of connects you to, oh, who who plays the shithead in the movie? Ah, uh, in Barbarian, like halfway um, through the film, yeah, um, Justin Long, Justin mm -hmm. Long's character. Mm -hmm. It's you find you find yourself having a hard time relating to him at first, and then they do, and then they kind of <laughs> play with your relating to him a little bit. 
Uh, yes. it, very good. Oh, and then uh, the guy who played Pennywise at the beginning too, really yes. good in that film because they he's a red herring. Now we're just, it's it's been out for, for a month. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I watched it on uh, Halloween. Very good Halloween watch. So uh, oh, I love it. I loved it. I saw it in theaters. No one else was hardly there. You know, and, and, but then word of mouth sort of came around. And then when it went on streaming, people discovered it. And it's um, I, from the trailer because it sets you up for that first act. And yeah. then doesn't really give you where this film's going. And so it's essentially a five act structure. Oh, and it, 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 and you're like thinking the film in your head is going one way. And then it does a complete zig and it goes a different direction. And, and I just love being in the hands of a director that's like, Stop trying to guess where we're going, but you know it's going to go on a good route because they're very confident in it and they're doing good yeah. so far. So you're like, okay, take me where you're going to go that. The themes were excellent in the movie and the way they sort of talked about different things. It ends up being like a meditative look at the history of Detroit, which I was not expecting. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a fascinating film, and I highly recommend it to everybody who hasn't seen it. But some people are taken aback by how grotesque <laughs> certain parts of it is yeah. and how um um and how schlocky it is at times but in i'm like of, yeah that's sort of gross out horror it's not that mm, bad though no I feel. And, I, and i and i don't like gross out things either but like it's hearkening back to sort of horror schlockiness that we have abandoned and it's like but it, it can still be about something more and still do the sort of schlocky horror that we have moved away from I think it's a good balance. And number one, number one is is what most people's are who've seen it. It's what yours is. It's everything, <laughs> everywhere, all at once. It's it's the it's the best film of last year, and um, it's uh, there's there's nothing close to it. Um, I, I've I, I, it's an amazing film. <laughs> there's some problems with it, but I haven't seen anything soar to the highs that that film soars to. Um, Mm -hmm. in years yeah we talk about a uh, uh a balance of uh comedy a balance mm -hmm. of uh like uh family you know tenderness uh, uh, uh sadness all these things action you know high octane action very fast paced um it, it's just the full the whole meal is right there and everything everywhere all at once so jimmy when are, when are you gonna see this movie <laughs> I, well, you kind of talked me into it, but I guess I will. Um, it has a monkey in it? Yeah. Uh, I think there's a monkey. No, I know there's a raccoon at some point. There's a raccoon. There's a raccoon. Okay. I thought you said earlier there was a monkey in some. I know there's a monkey in the Fablemans. So oh, there's a monkey in Get Out. Or, sorry, the Nope. is that, So a lot big year for monkeys yeah. between mm -hmm. Fablemans and Nope. But yeah, hey, uh, uh, raccoons and everything. Oh, the raccoon ones. joke never ceases to make, make me laugh. That's easily the best. Joke in the movie. I am off to a, a good start uh, this year. I've seen two John Swab movies, the Tulsa filmmaker, mm. uh, Candy Land and, and Little Dixie. And uh, Little Dixie is like the modern day cousin of Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia. Yeah. Uh, John Swab does not make films like other people make films. They're very dark and gritty and not happy or soft at all. So if that's uh, you dig that kind of stuff, go see John Swab movies. I really liked Candyland, and uh, I remember last year when you were on our Best of 2021 uh, show, you mentioned Ida Red as one of your Best of 2021, and I, so I, I need to see Little Dixie. I'm excited to see it. All right, Cade Thomas is the host of the Double Feature Movie Club podcast, as well as Kane and Friends, and Jimmy Tremel writes for the Tulsa World. Guys, thank you both so much for joining me today. Thank you. Behave. <laughs> All right, and I will post the links to both of their, uh, all their work in the description of this video. I've been Sam Carico, guys. You can find me on the various social media sites, including Twitter and Instagram, at Samuel D. Carico. Of course, the links for that will be in the description of this video, the show notes. Uh, thank you guys so much. That's the Film Fan Club Show. I hope you'll check us out next week, and until then, bye-bye. <laughs>